You're listening to Puma Podcast. Dito tayo sa Araneta Center Cubao Station ng MRT3. Just finished having to walk through three malls just to get from the Cubao Station of the LRT2 to, to the Cubao Station of the MRT3. You would think medyo malapit naman ang Aurora Boulevard sa EDSA. nag intersect naman yan. Pero actually mas mahaba nga yung ruta. Kapag dumaan ka sa tatlong mall, that's Gateway 1, 2, and Farmer's Market. I haven't had to take these non-disabled trains in a while. I forget how stressful they are. Grabe, siksikan talaga. I'm Franco Luna Puma Podcast and you're listening to Teka Teka News. In this episode, we talk about car centrism or how our cities and infrastructure are built around the needs of cars, not necessarily the people in cars or the people who don't have the means to afford cars. Car centrism is also about everyday choices. To me, it's anything that makes it difficult for for people to consider any other form of, of, of transportation. You've got car centricity for as long as you find yourself in a situation where where you know by design and by just gut feel that where you are sends you this very strong signal that you're not welcome and that you don't belong there. That's Ira Cruz. He's a transport planner and executive director of Alt Mobility PH. Before my interview with him in Makati, I had to walk toward the jeepney terminal after getting off the bus at Juan Ayala. If you're familiar with the area, you're made to walk away from the street just to get the ride toward it. Isn't that inefficient and counterproductive? It's not always been this way, and it shouldn't stay so. Ira and I met up with this goal in mind, to pick apart the idea and culture of car centrism here in the Philippines. Ira illustrates this further. Uh, to even as you get to your place of destination, you'll feel it. Like, so when you step out of the house, first of all, is there a sidewalk? Has that sidewalk also been reduced to a size that can barely fit you? Uh, does that sidewalk go up and down? As it passes through driveways, uh, are you able to cross the street anywhere? Or do you have to walk a couple hundred meters to the corner just to walk a couple of hundred meters back to your destination? Up until you arrive to your place of destination where you often find yourself walking in a driveway because there's no facility for, for, for walking. Or how there's not even a facility for persons with physical disabilities to be able to get up. According to the MMDA, 55% of all rides along EDSA, one of the most important thoroughfares in the country, are private motor vehicles. Yet, according to the social weather stations, car owners only comprise 6% of all Filipinos, while bike owners actually outnumber car owners 4 to 1. And I think that's it. That, that, that we're in a city where if you don't have a car, your planning of how to get to your destination just takes up so much time. Am I gonna take my bike today? Where am I gonna board? Where am I gonna get off? How much is it gonna cost? Am I gonna make it on time? Uh, these are considerations that motorists are independent from. Something I also want to highlight in this whole discussion on car centrism is that it's not even that cars are bad, even though they are inefficient. It's that it's more about the lack of options we have. Desire path, desire lines. Essentially, what it is is you you design around what naturally makes sense mm-hmm. for people right? and that they would go for the most efficient solution for themselves, right? Iro was talking about the idea of desire spaces. It's an urban planning best practice that worked in cities around the world. The basic principle is this. What makes more sense for you? And is that option available to you? That, unfortunately, isn't the case for anyone who has to climb the steps of Mount Kamuning or walk through three malls in Cubao. 
And if you're a pedestrian, you know what I mean. It's always met with a lot of opposition. Uh, when you look at intersections uh, and you look at the amount of time given to pedestrians across the street versus the amount of time allocated for green light, you'd see that they allocate anywhere from 60 seconds to 120 for cars and then give a measly 15, 20 seconds for people to cross the street. Yeah. You're actually putting people in danger because there's not enough space on the center island to accommodate everybody such that people are actually waiting in the middle of the street. And this happens a lot. Studies around the world have also shown that people who have to spend more time driving to work suffer more from depression, lack of sleep, and generally feeling lethargic and unwell. But they don't have a choice but to go through that anyway because our options are so limited. Yeah, I think the culture kasi ng pagiging car centric is driven mainly by the lack of option kasi wala naman talaga tayong public transportation na very uh, interconnected, no? So, uh, kaya ang tao na pipilitan na sumakay sa sarili ng sasakyan kahit how uh, very difficult then to maintain your own car, no? Pero uh, once public transportation is available, kaya ng mga tao eh na i-give up yung kanilang sasakyan. That's Andrea Villaroman. She heads the Climate Change and Environmental Sustainability Department of the Quezon City Local Government. We were talking about the city's vision of becoming a walkable, bikeable, 15-minute city in the coming years. One where the city's spaces belong to people, not cars. Car centrism is not as simple as preferential treatment in the eyes of the law or in the allocation of space. Because car centrism also breeds car centrism. Andrea and I also talked about the post-car Metro Manila and how it's entirely possible. It's heartening to see that some of our cities are catching on to that idea too. Pero when you provide walkable um, spaces, sidewalks, at maayos yung kanilang uh, paglalakaran, the same, similar to what we are building, yung mga Gora Lanes, um, yun po ay tingin ko makakatulong din para ma-entice yung mga tao na maglakad kesa sa uh, mag-take pa ng transportation ay eh, napakalapit lang naman ang pupuntahan. We're pausing for a quick break now. When we return, we'll tell you about our individual car centrism that learned dependence on cars and what we can do to unlearn that. How packed is Metro Manila really? Well, during daytime, the capital region's population swells to about 15 million. That's more people per square meter than Mumbai, making us one of the densest megacities in the world. And the car-centric solution to road congestion is to build more skyways and widening roads, mostly by removing sidewalks. Is that really a solution? And the demand for roads increases because every year, palobo ng palobo ang car sales. July 2023 alone saw a 33% increase in units sold compared from the year before. That's right, even with Carmageddon becoming a more regular occurrence, and just as businesses were normalizing operations after the coronavirus pandemic, lalo pang dumadami ang mga kotse sa daan. Let me point out too that 55% of car owners more often than not go on short trips of just 5 kilometers or less. That's because car centrism is systemic and has pervaded our urban planning and public policy for decades. It's become deeply and widely ingrained, and it's become personal. Yeah, it's a hegemonic belief, no? Uh, meaning, no one's challenging it. It becomes the dominant belief. And on a more psychological, social psychological perspective, it becomes common sense. That's Dr. Arvin Bollier. He teaches psychology at the Ateneo de Manila University. We reached out to him to ask about the effects of decades upon decades of car-centric thinking. Of course, I'm not absolving the government here. No, na parang if, if your roads have, have unclear lanes, unclear signs, that's also something. No, so it's a mixture of that discarded culture and the lack of regulation. Diba? Parang if alam mong there's a way to cut corners, you would do it. I, I observe that, eh, na parang hapila ako sa MRT, biglang may lulusot dun sa kabila. And I think Filipinos are, in general, very emotional. And studies have shown that. No? We are a highly emotional race, no? I would say, culture. 
Uh, and that translates a lot to impatience. Car centrism is why we have a lot of pedestrian over or underpasses. They're framed as pedestrian safety infrastructure, but they are there, in fact, so pedestrians don't have to slow down the flow of cars. And beyond mobility, car centrism affects our finances, our relationships, our daily choices, all seeping into practically every facet of our lives. I'd like to think one of our biggest traits, the things that we love, is we, we love community. We love being able to catch up with our friends, our neighbors. And we were talking about this with, uh, with some of my friends, that in order for us to hang out with each other, we need to buy something. We need to go to a coffee shop and spend. And I think that's an indirect result of our cities being car-centric, in the sense that cities have given up on, on building parks and community centers uh, in place for building roads. And so we've lost that sense of community or that opportunity to, to catch up with, with our neighbors, primarily because there's no opportunity for it. Yet even in places that claim to be walkable and pedestrian-friendly, the timer along pedestrian crossings lasts, what, maybe 10 seconds? Because the status quo is that cars are first. That's why we need counter cultures. This is, this is why we need counter discourses. No, no one's questioning why we are so dependent on cars in the first place. Yeah, that's the default. Na parang that's, that's the normal way. No? And that's why pedestrianization initiatives and bike infrastructure projects are so often met with a lot of resistance. You would still p- take it as a personal attack because you identify as part of that group. No, and I think Filipinos in particular are very vulnerable to this. No, we we are very cliquish in nature. No, we tend to identify a lot with the groups that we have. And in this case, fandom din siya. Um, except that it's not a K-pop artist or an actor, but it's the idea of being a motorist. Fairly recently, a study ranked Metro Manila's traffic problem the worst in the world for 2023. The MMDA questioned that label. Aminado silang masama, pero di naman daw pinakamasama. To fulfill its mandate to set policies on traffic in the metropolis, how has the MMDA tried to address traffic congestion? The biggest one is perhaps the number coding policy, which has been in place in one form or another since the mid-1990s. And how have private car owners responded to it? Did they go one day a week without the car? Did they take the bus or another form of public transportation? Or did they not just buy another vehicle? Several years ago, the MMDA asked provincial bus operators to move their terminals out of EDSA. Why inconvenience commuters further? The MMDA has also started penalizing motorcycles that take shelter from the rain under overpasses. Why refuse refuge for the vulnerable? I mean, when, when you talk to MMDA, they remain to be uh, focused on car speeds on, on EDSA, uh, then the number of passengers, or the, then the actual number of people that is being moved. Uh, we've talked to them several times about this, and that even the National Transport Policy specifically instructs government agencies to prioritize people throughput over vehicle throughput. Uh, they continue to use metrics such as average speed of cars on, on EDSA to measure their success. Safety reminders when a daily boot ay nakahawak sa mga safety handrails. It takes a very simple question to measure the success or failure of traffic policies. Kumusta lakad mo? Kumusta commute mo? Or yung ride mo? But the traffic policies I mentioned earlier build an environment that incentivizes buying more cars instead of solving the problem of mobility. Yet many of us on the road don't realize that we're not stuck in traffic. We are the traffic. And it's our transportation choices that contribute to or take away from everyone else's experience on the road. And the net effect of all this is a less mobile, less free, and less happy life for all road users. Car owners who waste a lot of time in traffic, and public transport commuters and drivers, cyclists, and pedestrians who risk life, limb, and livelihood navigating the streets of Metro Manila. Policymakers need to prioritize the majority instead of the minority. They also need to understand the needs of the majority 
policymakers need to ask how they can move most of the people in a way that is safe, convenient, fast, efficient, and eco-friendly. Here's Ira Cruz once again detailing the positive economic benefits of one alternative transportation option, cycling. We've done studies like Bikenomics, where we attempted to put monetary value on otherwise anecdotal benefits of, of biking. Uh, we'd always say things like, it's a lot cheaper to own a bike uh, than it is to own a car, uh, but not until the bike nomic study were we able to attach a monetary figure to that. Uh, but then the study was able to put a monetary value uh, that shows that building car infrastructure is nine times more expensive than building bike infrastructure. There's also figures in that study that show that biking, in fact, brings business. A lot of rest, and we've interviewed restaurant owners that have attested to, to saying that, uh, that a solid percentage of their income is derived from people coming in on bikes. And that was today's episode of Teca Teca News. Again, I'm Franco Luna. Our audio editor and designer is Pidoy Blanco. Our Teca Teca News executive producer is Jill Caro, and our senior editor is Veronica Uy. If you found this episode interesting or useful, share it with a friend or two. Drop us a line, and of course, don't forget to follow Teca Teca News and Puma Podcast on your favorite podcast app or on YouTube. Thanks for listening. <laughs>